Um, yeah, thank you for being with us, Marcel Schwitlik, Stefano Contiero, Travis Smalley, and Zenken, people from all over the world who are pioneers in working with code algorithms and plotter drawings. So um, Susanna just mentioned yeah, that I run expanded.art, so, and it's very important for me to be there myself basically every day because we're on a big shopping street, so a lot of people come in, and what's always very interesting for me to hear is that many people, when they see the physical work and then hear about NFTs, they're like, okay, code can be a medium that's new to people who haven't been in touch with generative art. And then they're like, yeah, but do they come from an analog practice? And I'm like, well, yeah, they come from you know working with code. So that is really something that seems to be important for people who haven't heard about artists working with code before. I know Zanken, you've you've come from oil painting, you've a, you have a painting and drawing practice. Um, yeah, would you like to tell us how you got got from like painting to NFTs and then to doing blotter drawings and um, how important your physical practice is because you're also someone who travels and you always bring these beautiful little prints which people love and then share on social media? Not always. So you don't have some with you? N not this time. <laughs> I don't have time anymore. So yes, uh, well, uh, I've been a painter before but uh, I think I've been exploring every kind of uh, medium possible and available to me and uh, the co the coding medium as well i've been programming since uh, i was a child i started at eight years old um, but for a long long time uh, even though i was uh, programming graphics i didn't consider that it was um, a place to express uh, my artistry or uh, that could be labeled art uh, so um, so i've placed my uh, need for uh, art making into uh, something more uh, traditional like oil painting but i've also done some uh, other things like uh, spray can art and uh, like graffiti and stuff a lot of stuff and then uh, thanks to the blockchain and the discovery of the nfts i've used the opportunity it was very opportunistic, actually. actually. <laughs> but I thought I have uh, something to, uh, to do in this place. And this is where I switched completely to uh, programmed art. So, and with uh, quite a success, actually. Uh, so, um, but uh, I haven't done any actual painting for uh, many years maybe eight or ten years, so it makes sense to uh, focus on, uh, on the digital. But we're here to, uh, to speak about physical. Uh, yeah, plotter drawings, but the interesting thing is that a robot, you've worked with Art Matter, they've, done, they've executed your, your physical practice, so I think for your collectors it's really important to get something physical along with it, because the question on this panel is, sort of like, is it either or? But I think, I guess for all of you also, um, Jan from Laurent Dom just mentioned it, like that Marcel Schwitlik, you issue basically a token and people can claim the physical piece. And I think you told me that some people don't understand it. So I guess you have collectors who want the physical piece and then get a token and vice versa. And some don't know. Um, test, yeah. Um, the thing, if I kind of think about it in a way that I have a little bit of this system laid out for me that it makes sense for me to have an understanding of have like a you know like a transparent um, index of like overview of what I've been done so I kind of like mint the finished works and like this I kind of um, you know I can remove like lose all of my data all of my archive and I can go on a library computer and like find my my you know my art overview so it's kind of like a I like this um, decentralized database aspect of that. Travis, how is that for you? You do the, I um, guess people who are on, collect on the Tezos blockchain, now Travis for the pixel rugs. Um, yeah, some for a certain period of time, you mint pixel rugs every day and it's like really, it looks like rugs made out of pixels. And I think the funny guys, Jan, how many do you have? Is Jan still here? I think they're the biggest holders, like more than 100 or so. Um, very impressive. 200 by now. More than 200. 
Wow, more than 200 pixel rocks, congratulations. And they're really beautiful. Thank you, <laughs> <laughs> um, but you also have blotter drawings and they're black and white. And people, like when they come to the gallery, they really seem to understand it because it looks like it looks like a rug, right? So how does that play together, the colorful pixel rocks and then the physical ones? And then you actually also have a real rug. Oh, yeah. Um, I, I think that uh, I come from like photography and imaging and this place of how we translate, like when you're working on the computer, you're always zooming in and zooming out and there's always these change of scales that happen and trying to communicate that on Twitter or something of like zooming in is kind of hard and it's so much natural physically, right? And so there's like all these things of translating and, and even how I got into generative systems was um, automation and Photoshop and you would write something and then have image processor make a thousand images and then when you make a thousand images, it's like, how do you look at them? Like, because like looking at a thousand images in a browser or on Finder is like really difficult. And printing it out in a book actually becomes this way more um, intuitive and reflexive and react. Like it, it's a great way to kind of see through it. So everything I make, I tend to do it in lots of different ways. Like I've been working on this kind of maze generation things now that I'm trying in woodcuts. And, and it's all because there's new materialities and textures that happen when you print things that then go and inform the thing you're making before. So like the plotter drawings that we have in the show, a lot of the ideas that I was then seeing done in pen um, and how it pressed into the paper then can kind of go back in and form like warp algorithms, like uh, warp functions or the ways that it's doing. So you can start to play with it and maybe think, make things seem out of sync or out of time and in interesting ways that might uh, give a more open read to what the work is. You just mentioned a very high number, and I also recently had an artist, oh yeah, I just produced 20,000 images with AI, and like, I don't know, yeah, we spoke the day before, and suddenly you had 20,000 images, um, and oh, your algorithms also can produce very high numbers, so how do you select the work, and is it is it a difference, maybe, uh, Stefano, uh, for uh, how, how, A, what's <laughs> your criteria for selecting the work? Do you also sometimes ask your collectors? Um, yeah. how, how do you do that? It's, it's wild. I know writing a sentence is already difficult selecting, but then you have 20,000 images. How does it work? Yeah, I think this is one of the hardest questions to answer for a generative artist. For me personally, there are two metrics. Let's call it like that. The first one is uh, uh, whenever I get stuck into continually like watching new generation from an algorithm means like I'm onto something. It means usually I take a break, probably a couple of days and then go back and uh, refresh the algorithm and I f if I find it like likable, please, pleasing, it's, it's done and then starts the curation process. Um, the other metrics I have usually is uh, uh, how would the algorithm, how would the art uh, lives in the physical space? It's, uh, it's very important to me every time I create in my mind the art should live somewhere physically. Uh, doesn't necessarily mean I I don't envision screens, but it means the screen is always in a physical space. Otherwise, I, I really uh, connect with what you said about like uh, zooming in and out. There's uh, different ways and layers to see uh, an artwork. If you go closer, you see a lot of details. If you go farther away, you can see the bigger picture. And in general, uh, I feel like the physical space also, I loved what Anne and Michael Spatler yesterday said. They leave with you you get time, you see the, the artwork in, uh, in different occasion, with different lights, with different uh, season and so on, it becomes part of your uh, life. And uh, that's really powerful for me. That's always like uh, what I aim to, to have my work uh, seen and experienced uh, through time in a very physical place. It doesn't need to be in the foreground, it needs to be in the background, it needs to accompany people uh, in their life. I had a conversation with Anne Spalter, you've just mentioned Anne and Michael Spalter, who have one of the biggest private collections of early com uh, computer art. And Anne said when she herself as an artist started doing NFTs, she offered, if I remember correctly, um, uh, collectors the physical piece and most of them didn't want it. And so maybe let's speak about the elephant in the room because um, we're dealing with technology. I had to work on a project this morning and launch something and then things didn't work, right? And with the blockchain, we don't know what might be in five or 10 years. So how do you deal with that? And especially that you work with code, you can print it out. Um, so how do you see that? And is that also a way for you if you have a plotter drawing and that goes with the collector that you know, okay, you don't have to feel bad because they have something from you? 
in case something goes wrong with the blockchain, <laughs> uh, which we might not know. Uh, like Stefano said, uh, for me as well, uh, when I make a digital work, I uh, try to uh, have the possibility of uh, turning it into a physical piece. So uh, most of my generative art pieces are uh, plottable, which means they can export uh, a file that is uh, accepted by uh, pl uh, plotter machines. Uh, but as you said, not everyone wants a work as a physical. I mean, the, the blockchain and um, digital ownership, it solved so many problems of the physical world. Uh, and, uh, and Shipping is complex. <laughs> Shipping is complex and costly and takes time and uh, you uh, quickly run out of uh, wall space as well. So uh, I'm sure uh, most of the collectors uh, know that uh, issue. Uh, they, w they really fancy having physical works of uh, every artist they collect, but at some point uh, all the physical end up in uh, folders and you don't have any space anymore to uh, to display them properly. Um, so, uh, well, I, I made the experience, by the way, like uh, offering a, um, a free plot of work for uh, some of the NFTs that were collected. And to my surprise, only uh, something like one third of the collectors actually claimed the physical piece. Um, because uh, many collectors are um, like satisfied with the principle of uh, digital ownership, and I really don't care about the physical. I also sometimes don't claim things I can tell you why, because I'm too lazy to take care of shipping. And then customs, and it doesn't arrive, then you have to run after it, right? So I find it really comfortable. And I also heard that from collectors, they simply don't want to deal with, if, if an NFT comes with a physical, then they're like, no, I don't want to have it. I don't want to have to deal with anything physical in my life, um, which I find really interesting. What's your experience, Marcel? How was the claim court for your pieces? <laughs> um, I have to say that um, um, I kind of want to it maybe sounds weird, like I just want to keep my work sometimes, you know, or like I'm, you know, the, well, it's difficult to give it away, you know, because I, I, I want to keep it. So I'm like, oftentimes um, I have absolutely no problem with uh, collectors who, in a, in a way, like uh, Jonas Lund said, like, I don't know, it's like a, the futurist thing, you know, literally just to um, support me. And so it's like two benefits for me, like I am supported and at the same time I get to keep my work and I can, you know, I can take care of it. And it's like, um, um, like this, at least I know that this work, which where I'm like working with uniques and the, the process for me is um, um, like an important part of the work where I um, kind of like trying to check out an area where I cannot, um, even if I wanted to reproduce a work. So it's like that definitely like some um, parts of the process are out of my control. So it's like, like Le Random also was mentioning, to extend the generative art definition a little bit more and like I kind of play around in this world. And um, I, think, I think it's also um, for me a challenge to get used to getting, you know, having my work with other people because it's obviously also, um, you know, fantastic to um, feel that people are identified and like it. Um, but yeah, like um, either way, it's absolutely um, uh, fine for me, actually. And you're also one of a kind uh, when it comes to working with plotters. How many do you have right now? Last number I heard is like 40. Did the number go up? Number went up. Number went up. <laughs> so it's very impressive. Um, yeah, I highly recommend to anyone being in Berlin maybe to visit um, Marcel's studio. It's, um, yeah, it's a one of a kind experience. Yeah. Come, everybody. And. Um, but what I find really interesting, then, I mean, you're, 
if you don't follow him already, it's really interesting to follow him and then keeping us posted on what's going on with pens and technology. And then 84-year-old um, Hans Dillinger, who is with us and was on stage yesterday, he also tries to get the plotter to work. Um, and I think you have a guy working with you, but, but how is that? Then you have these old machines, you have the pens who don't work anymore. So then you suddenly, now we have the thing in the future with the blockchain, and then you have the issue with the machines. So... Um, should we all switch to canvas and paint because it's less complicated? No. So how do you deal with that? Um, it's not easy. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, this, I mean, it's a, it's, the, it's a chaotic process and it's, um, um, it's, um, um, it's not a straight line and it's like, um, um, it has, you know, it's like literally every, you know, every uh, day is new and like an exploration of like, doing something that uh, like I personally haven't done yet and then it's um, there's this better I don't know like too much to do and like too much than like too little or you know I don't know that's a, I have the feeling a little bit my uh, view but um, yeah like um, there is I don't know I have the feeling like 10 lifetimes of work waiting for me right now already so it's like it, so it doesn't also matter so I'm just navigating without a map but more with a Compass. Yesterday I saw a tweet, someone said he's 1.5 years in, uh, in the NFT space and it's like 15 years in the real world. Um, I guess you also all feel like that. So yeah, we have, let's see, three minutes sort of left and you all want to go to the lunch break, I guess. So you will definitely finish in time. So yeah, how, how do you deal with the issue of looking into the future blockchain? We don't know what's going to happen and then also the machines and um, yeah. So I will be very quick. Uh, it keeps me awake at night, <laughs> meaning that uh, one of the things I try always to do, I have my work reproducible uh, almost in a perfect way. And that's why I, I believe NFTs and blockchains are kind of the de facto standard artwork. And then it comes the physical that can be reproduced and will never be identical and perfect to the NFT because of uh, physical limitation. And that's the beauty of it, I believe. Yeah. Um, I like. I just hope to keep exploring between the spaces. Um, there's uh, th this moment, like I've been with doing woodblock printing, and there's this moment when you're at the press and you pull the paper up and it's this kind of the pool and you get to see like what it actually looks like. And it's very similar to like when you finally run your software, you run your program and you start seeing the outputs and it's like you've done all this work and then you're kind of seeing it and adjusting based off of it. And there's so many types of lessons and experiences you gain in that. And so I, my goal is that I can kind of keep finding new things like that to kind of then inform all the types of images I'm making. Conclusion? Yeah, conclusion about your future. Oh, about the Going future. back to oil painting. No. Uh, for sure, um, yeah, blockchain solved uh, the, the problem of um, um, maintaining uh, digital works. We, we kind of uh, feel more secure about uh, artworks to uh, outlive uh, us on the blockchain. Uh, and then uh, physical pieces, uh, I consider them they are more like uh, different views on a digital artwork different possibilities of viewing a digital artwork. Uh, so, um, so, and there, there could be more uh, physical views of a digital artwork in the future, provided we, we, we keep the, the source file, like it could be the source code or a, a JPEG, uh, provided this, this uh, source code for, uh, for the image is still there, uh, in the future, we can still make physicals, or either plotters, new plotter works, or uh, new prints uh, with new printing techniques. Just different views on what's the core of the artwork. Thank you, that's beautiful closing words. And I think we are, it's not even blinking red, so thank you so much and bon appétit. Thank you.